So Kerry, what has been your journey in exploring Aboriginality within yourself and your family? Yep, I always knew I was Aboriginal, but didn't know where I belonged in any of that. Um, and when, I think when I was about 17 or 18, I asked my dad, you know, who our mob was, and he said something, and it just it didn't even sound like an Aboriginal mob. It was really bizarre because my dad hadn't had much to do or he didn't absorb the knowledge when it was being shared in the family. Um, then I moved towns and we met another Aboriginal family and they went, well, yeah, we're actually connected to you via this. And they showed me that the family tree and they said, well, we're on this side and you're on that side and something inside me healed. And I went, I belong somewhere. Um, and then just started asking them questions, started connecting in with other family members that I hadn't known for a long time, um, talking to other people in the community who had known my family who had lived in the town where I, <laughs> where I moved to. Um, so it was all, a, you know, having those conversations and building those relationships with people. Um, I went to uni to become a primary school teacher yeah. and kind of did a lot of research as part of that and just went, yep, I need to connect and I need to find out more. And since then I've been like a bit of a bower bird just collecting and collecting and, you know, we've our one of the traditional owner groups has now become a registered Aboriginal party. So we're learning a lot um, when as mob we all come together my family is not just my little, you know, nuclear family anymore. It's acknowledging all the elders in the past as well and the ancestors they've descended from. You talk about doing some study at uni. Just go back to primary school. How much Indigenous uh, history or knowledge was were you taught at school? None that I can remember. Yeah. Yeah. I... I can't even remember the, there was never an acknowledgement to country. Yeah. There was, I really, there was no such recognition as Reconciliation Week or NAIDOC Week or anything like that. So, yeah, I cannot remember anything being done about the Aboriginal people. It wasn't until I got to high school and I think it was in year 10 that we did Australian studies and it was all about Captain Cook coming over and blah, 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 and that all the Aboriginal people in Victoria died, you know, all moved away. Um, and the kid sitting next to me, he knew I was Aboriginal and he just looked at me and said, well, how come you're here then? Mm -hmm. You know, and you just kind of go, okay. So I think that's what drives me to do the job that I do, to change the story. Learning about the true history, though, has it always been easy to hear? No. No. <laughs> Definitely not. But confronting those things, for me, is a bit of a healing thing. I need to know some of the really nasty stuff that has happened in my family and to know that my ancestor was put on a, a reserve to keep her safe and then that reserve shut down so she was put on a mission and then that mission, you know, they were moved around all over the country but the fight that was in those ancestors now runs through, you know, the blood from them runs through my veins so I'm going to continue their fight and I hope that my children continue that fight after me. Question, do you have any... First Nations idols that you look up to? Yeah. I think Kathy Freeman is probably one straight off the top of my head. You know, her going against the grain and, you know, whenever she won the Commonwealth gold or the Olympic gold and carrying the Aboriginal flag around to highlight it, that, you know, the that Australia is not just, um, you know, the... The English heritage, it is us as well. Um, Michael Long is, you know, I, I've always been an Essendon fan and for him to call out racism when it was happening and now that he has, he does the long walk every single year, we always go down, we watch the Dreamtime at the G and that's kind of all stemmed from 
you know, the, this incident at the football, you know, and him needing to get that message of change out there. Um, yeah, plenty more. Like I've just finished reading Eddie Betts' book and that just blew me away as well. That's amazing. You know, to, yeah, it, oh, absolutely. And to think that we're aware of some of the racist stuff that happened to him, but there was a lot more that was in the background that we didn't know about. You know, he... We're all we're all different, yet we all go through some of the same stuff. And I guess my great 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 grandmother and my grandmother to know that you know my great great grandmother stood up at the inquiry to uh, the coroner commission, and in a time where you know women didn't have a voice, but her being an Aboriginal woman and sharing her story, that is absolutely huge. And every other woman that has come since then, you know, a lot of my aunts I hold dearly, you know, because they're the ones that hold the knowledge for me now. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And learning about that history is part of your journey as well, isn't it? It is. It is. To know the fights that they went through, you know, my great-great-grandfather and great-great-grandmother they helped set up the Aborigines Advancement League, you know, to know that they did that was amazing. So, yeah, it, it is part of who I am now. Do you feel like what the tips and strategies would you offer early childhood educators who may have no idea even where to start on their personal journey about understanding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history? Ask. <laughs> Ask. Find out if there is as like Kesso's are Victorian based so one if their service is in Victoria reach out to the Department of Education and ask for Kesso's if there are um, Aboriginal education group groups in your areas for the rest of Australia ask them that's our role is to help early childhood services in embedding perspectives reaching out to the right um the right people at the right time and it may take time not everyone is wanting to walk into services not everyone feels confident about talking about their own aboriginality or their own backgrounds so it is going to take time linking into other groups um, other early childhood services that may already be on that journey themselves set up a facebook group and talk to each other um, there are places available if you need to. Approaching aunties and aunt, uncles and community members um, and, you know, ask about their stories, get advice, learn, you know, do their own, cult, do, do, absolutely do the cultural appreciation training. You know what I mean? It's, it's absolutely vital for every professional to get cultural awareness training. And I'm so worried that many early childhood educators it isn't made mandatory. I remember when I was when I was doing it. You know, you just you'd, you'd waltz all you'd waltz on in. You'd care for the kids, and there was no professional training, so you don't know. You know, so focus on your own learning. Be curious. Ask questions. Keep learning. You'll build confidence. Yeah, and that's what we got to do. Just 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 start. Speak to someone. Visit a, visit visit a co-op. You know, we're friendly. Okay. Cool. Done. So topic four is personal journeys, right? Mm -hmm. So and what we're trying to say here somewhere as well, Tristan, is that as Aboriginal people, we have to learn to. We don't know everything Aboriginal yep. as well. Does that make sense? So every time we meet new Aboriginal people, one thing that we do is stop and listen to their story. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. So what is your journey? Um you know, growing up Aboriginal. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like that question. I don't, like, I don't know what I'm asking there. Uh, five, four, three. I'm going to reword that a little bit. Go for it. Five, four, three, two, one. Uh, like being Aboriginal, um, people presume that you know everything about everything that's Aboriginal. Yeah. That's probably not a true reflection of the reality, is it? No, no, not not at all. You know, I'm always learning. 
yeah something i've learned like i can actually bring away from my from my course um is this term called cultural humility now cultural humility is all about being humble and wanting to learn about cultures that you don't you don't know about and like look <laughs> aboriginal people are so diverse we're talking about a nation of hundreds of countries you know were i mean language groups um land rights like land barriers like just down here in um where i am rundry land or the kulin nation you know there, there's five different countries like it's <laughs> it's so so diverse and i'm not from here being an Abri I'm, I'm an aboriginal man and I, i've i've said it before i'm from new south wales you know what i mean i'm a i'm on rundry country as a rundry person my family and my people's customs and the way they do things right down to the painting or um hunting any of it you know what i mean get rid of the stereotypes <laughs> um it's different it's different to what we do down here you know we share a we share a common connection to our land and the concept of our ancestors and our feelings but it's different and it's so diverse so i'm here as a visitor on this country i've been in i've been in melbourne i've been in rundry land for 10 years but i'm always learning and i'll always be a visitor you know what i mean i'm still every every professional meeting i'm at i'm still doing an acknowledgement to country you know i'm still learning every single day so yeah it's it's incredibly important to continue learning and even from a perspective as an aboriginal man you know i don't know everything and i don't pretend to know everything and it can be a real pain when people would like to think, oh, look, he's Aboriginal, I'll ask him about something. I, I may not know. Most of the time I won't know, <laughs> you know, because it's so, so diverse. And you mentioned before not learning a lot at school. I mean, primary school you did, but a lot of high school you didn't learn much about culture. Do yeah. you think um, when people are working with Aboriginal families, do they have to expect sometimes that the family may not know a lot about culture? Absolutely. You know, um, I may mention before, I don't know, but when we're thinking about the stolen generation, which is so prevalent today, you know, the, people think that this happened 50, 100 years ago. It's not. We, we're part of it. My family has been directly, directly... Um, a direct sub sorry i'm trying to find the word there <laughs> directly part of this Impact, sorry impacted direct that's the word i'm looking for my family has been directly impacted by the stolen generation you know what i mean and what what that means is um i don't need to get right into it but people were taken away from their families little aboriginal babies and children were taken away from their families and had their entire culture completely stripped away from them they were brought up to believe that they were not aboriginal you know what I mean? And people to this day, and they will continue, are just reconnecting with their family and they're just reconnecting with their culture. So, you know, they're not, people um, are just finding out so that they, they don't know a lot. You know what I mean? A lot of people might have thought that they spent, they grew up their whole life just as Australian, no real identity. And the next thing they know, oh, actually, I've got an auntie or uncle who want to connect with me. And now I'm learning about my culture. So how on earth would they know anything about their Aboriginal, their Aboriginal past, their Aboriginal culture? So they're learning, you know what I mean? So don't walk into a room with somebody who's Aboriginal or other Aboriginal people or Torres Strait Islander people and think, okay, you're Aboriginal, you must know everything about everything, so I'll ask you. I actually cop this all the time when I'm at uni and I try to keep my head down with, with it sometimes, you know what I mean? Because they think, oh, there's a subject or a conversation happening about Aboriginal affairs or history and they're like, oh, Tristan should know about it, all right, he's Aboriginal. I'm like, hey, guys, I'm learning too, <laughs> you know, um, and we'll always learn. We, we just keep learning. It's a cultural humility, <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have any First Nations idols that you look up to? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, people might be aware of uh, Dr. Tom Kalma. You know, he's he's the he, he's the big CEO, big big name when it comes around to um, Aboriginal quit smoking or tackling Indigenous smoking. Um, 
a big chunk of my career, uh, four to five, uh, yeah, about four to five years of it, um, I was a Aboriginal tobacco cessation worker or an Aboriginal quitline specialist. And his work um, on tackling Indigenous smoking and just in the whole Aboriginal health awareness section um, was highly impactful on me. You know what I mean? I still follow different videos or, you know, still got him on Facebook, things like that. And, you know, I've had the opportunity and delight of meeting him a couple of number of times. Um, and, you know, AJ, I have to talk about you because <laughs> I can't not talk about my main idol, uh, you know, is my brother. How I've literally, you literally pulled me out of the dirt and gave me a life and an education and a whole world, you know what I mean? And I feel so humbled and so I have the words <laughs> to look up to somebody who's done as much for Aboriginal people as you've done, you know. So, you, you know, I follow everything you do. I, I, I wouldn't say I completely follow in your footsteps, but I try to. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you, you've paved the way, not just for me, but for so many young and emerging Aboriginal people. You know, the work AJ has done with, um, you know, countless high school Aboriginal students just finding their culture and wanting to reconnect and, you know, giving people confidence and <laughs> his work across the entire social work community section as a whole has been completely phenomenal, you know, and I will continue to learn from you. You're a great mentor. Um, and yeah, that's what I got to say there. Thanks, bro. And um, <laughs> thank you. So what tips and strategies would you offer early childhood educators who maybe have no idea where to start their personal journey to reconciliation? Yeah, I would suggest start by asking questions, right? Be open-minded, want to engage. You know, just this, this term, curiosity, just being curious. Um, it's, it's funny how many people will just look at this as a, as a, you know, whatever, dust on the carpet kind of, kind of thing. Be curious. Ask questions. If we're not scary people, you know what I mean? We might get sick of it if people aren't, if they're oblivious or they come in with a set stereotype or something. But most Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people you meet will be happy to share their stories with you, you know, will be happy to engage with you, to teach, I mean, to teach you. If you don't know, you don't know. And, and we get that. You know, Aboriginal people, myself, you, AJ, we've had to put up with prejudice. We've had to put up with racism our entire lives. You know what I mean? So just start by asking. Start by asking those questions, being mindful, you know. Start by look, booking yourself. in. The, if you haven't done, I'm just going to say it again, if you haven't done cultural appreciation, cultural awareness training, start there. All right, get your organization to do it, get somebody to do it, because that's going to give you, I'm going to say the basics, but it's going to give you a really good overview of what Aboriginal history and what Aboriginal oppression and people have been through. You know what I mean? Um, so it's really important, but just start by asking questions. Hey, Bindi, growing up uh, while you're at school, like in primary school and secondary school, how much Aboriginal history did you kind of learn? I didn't really learn any of the only time Aboriginal people were mentioned was when Captain Cook arrived in Australia. That was basically it. Um, so the lesson normally ended with me going, hey, it's not what happened. Yeah. And then getting booted out of the class. Yeah. Well, just to put for some people, what, well, without disclosing your whole age, what, First, sometimes, what century was that in? Because some <laughs> that people something that was years and years ago. But what we're talking about the eighties here or the night? Talking about the early eighties. Um, I don't mind saying I was born in seventy four. So by the time I went to school, it was nineteen eighty. Um, so not long ago. Mm. Do you think people are shocked to hear that? I I think they. I don't know, you know, I, 
when I talk about the stolen gen and say, hey, you know, it's still happening in the 70s, people are like, no. So I, I don't, they might be shocked. Yeah, they might. Yeah. Um, where did, in any part of your education, where did Aboriginal issues start to appear? In school? Yeah. Or in, do you go to uni? I did. Yeah, what did you study? Uh, early childhood. Was there any Indigenous perspectives in that course? Uh, luckily for me, the first year of it was an Aboriginal childcare course. So, yes. Second year, no. Mm. Not really. No. Has that changed a lot, do you know? Uh, I, I, I don't know, actually. I've not had that conversation with any up-and-coming childcare workers. Yeah. Do you know? I do know that there is a, a unit called Promote Cultural Safety, but it, because it's a training package per se, there's no curriculum that goes with it. So it's only as good as the person who's actually <laughs> delivering it Get ya. in what content the students are actually taught or explained. Mm, and that's bad. Yeah. And I think the saddest part too, it's not always taught by an Aboriginal person. It's very rarely taught by yeah. an Aboriginal person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're on your own journey growing up. You, you always knew that you're Aboriginal. But how connected have you been to culture and your Aboriginality? Uh, very connected. I grew up in the Melbourne Aboriginal community. Um, my mum always worked well when I went to school. Mum went out to work. Um, before that, she was a stay-at-home mum. So, and she always worked within the Victorian Aboriginal community. So, um, you know, during the week, she was at work, weekends, all of the, there was always community events when we were growing up. So we were always at, you know, a day out with the community on the weekends, whether, and even, you know, back then they used to have things throughout the night. Um, a lot of the weekends we would travel home uh, to Yorta Yorta country for the weekend. So very connected. I'm very lucky. Yeah. Um, you're always still learning though, aren't you, about culture? Always, always. And I'm happy to stand corrected on a lot of the issues, which, you know, the elders don't mind pulling you up now and again. Yeah. Because I think, I think what people sometimes forget that we do come from very diverse parts of the country. Yeah. And we're not an expert on everything Aboriginal. Not at all. But do you find that some people think <clears throat> it might be, like an information bureau, bureau, bureau of <laughs> Aboriginal? De definitely. Like, um, People just assume you are, you're Aboriginal, you've grown up and you know everything, but what they need to realise, a lot of our history for, was stolen from us. Um, you know, during invasion, we were told we couldn't speak language anymore. So that was gone. And you know, a lot of these mob now just expect that we speak fluently when we're home, but they don't realise the atrocities that happened years ago have impacted us even today. We don't have a lot of our culture or traditional practices, a lot of the language is gone. So, yeah, we, we don't know everything and we're going to continue to learn until the day we die. Do you think people are challenged by the true history? Definitely. Truth-telling is difficult. A lot of the time people don't want to hear the truth and whether that's because of their own belief or, you know, you would have heard this comment, just move on, forget about it. And that, that's the attitude of them, but, you know, they're not still living the transgenerational trauma from a lot of those um, impacts. Yeah. Um, do you have any First Nations idols that you look up to? Um, I come from a really strong family of leaders. My grandfather was a minister, a teacher, um, his brother-in-law was Uncle William Cooper. Um, my grandfather, Shad, um, Shadrach Livingstone James. Um, his father was a Mauritian man, but taught a lot of our mob from Cumra. So, you know, my grandfather, Shadrach, Uncle William Cooper, my mum, just, she's my biggest idol. 
And your mum was just recently inducted into, I was going to say the Hall of Fame. It's the, uh, the, the <laughs> Victorian... The Victorian Aboriginal Honour Roll. Honor and roll. also she was inducted to the Victorian Women's Honour Roll. Oh, wow. Yeah, so she's doing good this year, the old girl. She'd be very yeah. proud if she was here. If I asked you to summarise her in Ooh. a couple of minutes, how would you describe your mum? Um, oh, you'll make me emotional, firstly. Today's actually her memorial. Oh. So she's been gone six years today, but, um, well, definitely staunch. She took no crap from nobody. She was a very strict woman, but that I wouldn't change a bit of it. But she just had a harder goal. An example was, you know, she worked for VACA on and off over the span of 25 years, both paid and voluntary. Um, her days were just gruelling work. You know, back then in the 80s, a lot of the stolen mob were making their way home. The stories were really difficult. Resources were so minimal that a day for her of what at work could entail going to Warrnambool and back in one day after spending the whole day in court there and half the time coming home with a tribe in tow because the only option at that day in court was for these children to go with non-Aboriginal family and she just wasn't going to let that happen. So throughout her lifetime at VACA, it's estimated that within our own home, she cared for about 200 children. So I think that's just indicative of the type of person that she was and you know she was a single parent of six so we weren't doing well financially times were tough but it just didn't matter how tough it was at home she wasn't going to let these kids go go elsewhere yeah well in a way her being honored is a tribute to the woman that she she definitely was definitely yeah and at least your kids can see that and your grandkids can see that. Definitely. Future. Yeah. It's beautiful for the grandkids to see because, I mean, she got to meet them all, um, but she didn't, she wasn't here on earth long enough to see them grow into adults, but for them to grow into adults and see that the type of work and impact that she had made. Yeah. And I know I've spoken to you offline before about knowing your mum yeah I, I was surprised yeah I, I met your mum where when she was working at Vaca when I first came to Melbourne and how welcoming and caring she was for someone that was quite lost in in culture and and trying to work out my family issues yeah. how she took me kind of under her arm and she was gave the advice that never let never let anybody tell you you can't do something or you can't be something yeah and wasn't scared a couple of times to clip me on the back of the head and go boy that's not what you do <laughs> oh so you feel my pain <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i kind of know what you live with uh, but i only copped it a few times um so yeah i i just want to just put in here that you know your mum was a really remarkable yeah. beautiful well woman. that's very sweet very sweet um I, honestly we my sister and I we still get phone calls today from people who came in contact with mum at Backer and you know just trying to piece puzzle piece parts of their life puzzle back together and all of their stories are just like yours um but yeah she she was an no mess woman if you mucked up she was going to tell you but I'm so thankful for that and I I know how lucky I am to have a mum like her. I'm, I'm going to ask you on camera and would you mind in our on our resources me having a link to some articles about your mum so people yeah not a problem yeah cool. Uh, the last little question I've got in this little section is what tips and strategies would you offer early childhood educators who have no idea where to start their own journey on understanding Aboriginal history? Definitely reach out to some organisations on the country where you're living or working or both 
Um, I think that's a good start. I, I think that is the start of a healthy and respectful relationship. And from there, other relationships will blossom. And I think then we would have a, an, an amazing educator on our hands. AJ, what did you learn at school or during your studies post-school about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures? I can tell you at primary school, I learned very little. And at high school, I learned a little bit about the traditional owners, only that I was at a high school that um, our emblem was the, the mountain that, you know, on our, on our school em emblem was the, uh, the mountain that was not far from where we lived and that it actually had a Bunjalung name. And so we, we learn a, a lot about the, the, the local people. Right? It was often told, and it was told by Bunjalung elders and um, Bunjalung kids in the class when I went to uni, very little was covered in my social work course at all. Um, I went to Melbourne Uni. Uh, I went to Victoria University to do my bachelor degree, and there was nothing about Aboriginal issues in it at the time. And I did my elective at Melbourne University in an Aboriginal subject so I could actually learn a little bit more about the the theory behind working with Aboriginal people, if that makes sense. But it wasn't a core component in my course. I do now, I do now know that Victoria University has a lot of Aboriginal input into the into the course, in the Bachelor of Social Work course. Um, Tristan is currently at doing his bachelor's degree at Victoria University. And he was saying that in, in nearly every subject, they actually have some sort of indigenous input put into it as well as actually having an indigenous specific subject so we know things have changed but I learned very little um, as a nurse I, I was about my fifth or sixth day on the ward and I was given a book that said how to work with an aborigine and it was what it was called as how to work with an aborigine and oh. it actually had it was typed and it actually had statements like do not look at them in the eyes it may be offensive do not do this, do not do this, do not do this, that I was kind of half laughing at some of the statements they were telling me not to do. And it was kind of an interesting uh, way of actually being inducted because I don't think nursing up until, and again, about 10 years ago, has really incorporated Indigenous issues into the actual courses they actually do. Mm. but I think we're getting better that's what I'm actually saying mm. do you have any first nation idols that you look up to I do I look I, I admire Ani Dai her I think she's an amazing um, advocate for indigenous issues I think she's been a great mentor to me um over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. She's a person that has taught me that um, it's okay to be me, that I don't need to pretend to be anyone else but myself. She's also taught me that um, I'm a leader. And initially when she said that I was a leader, I didn't believe her because as a kid I was bullied at school and I was one that was kind of pushed down a lot. And I go, I, I don't lead. But she actually said, you are a leader in thought change. And that's what I do. I walk into classrooms and I come in with one, I come in and a group of people are thinking certain things about culture, for example, and they walk out thinking something completely different. I do mental health first aid training and people come in with not much understanding about mental health and they walk out going, look, I'm a now a mental health first aider that can actually assist my family and friends because un I understand what the signs and symptoms are. So she taught me that I am a leader of, of change, of thought change. Um, and my other bit of an idol is um, Adam Goods. Um, being able to <clears throat> experience everything that he went through 
um, the bullying, the booing, the um, calling it out, you know, all the flack you got from calling it out and then being able to, you know, and what I do admire is he didn't cope well with it at all initially, you know, he had to, he had to get away from it and he had to reprocess. But when he came back, he came back stronger. And, you know, he started a movie to highlight the racism that actually occurred and, and showed the, the world exactly what it's like to be an Aboriginal man in 2000 and, you know, I don't know exactly what year was it, 2019, 20? You know, so within the last five years, that discrimination still does actually exist. And I think the biggest form of discrimination in 2022 is denying that discrimination actually occurs. Um, so we do need to actually sit back and actually understand what discrimination does look like from an Aboriginal perspective. And that's why I admire both those. Thank you. What tips and strategies would you offer early childhood educators who have no idea where to start? Um, I think the first thing is to actually... Again, I think I've said it before, go and do some research. Actually Google search um, Aboriginal timelines, you know, go and actually find out what some of the significant uh, historical points are. Um, and even so, how recent some of those hist historical points actually are. It's about getting out and moving away from just doing cultural awareness to actually trying to make change within your early childhood service. You know, it's about let, let's, if we don't have a rap, let's, let's get a rap going. Let's actually get Aboriginal people to come in and share their voices. It's, it's about moving forward in the doing of stuff, not just saying that we're going to do things, but actually doing the doing bit. Um, and it's okay that if you don't get it right all the time, I think what we want to see is more doing than more just saying things are going to get there. 